So how to structure your literature essay. So the first thing you want to do is you want to start by looking at the assessment objectives. Now for literature, regardless of the exam board that you're taking, so whether it be AQA, Edexcel, Educast, WJC, OCR, you need to make sure that you are one, developing a personal response. That means the, the examiners are looking for your interpretation. Remember, they're going to be reading hundreds of essays. So they want to know what you think. Now, obviously, you can't just go off on a random tangent. You must be able to support your interpretation. And you do that by using quotes, as well as an awareness of different perspectives. So what does that mean? Well, it means that you showcase your understanding that one, you may interpret it one way, but actually somebody else might view it in a different light, and uh, particularly the contemporary audience. So what that means is um, the readers or audience of the time um, the piece of literature was written. You wanna analyze language, form and structure using relevant subject terminology. Too often students fall down because they forget that they need to use their knowledge of language and structure and form um, when breaking down quotes. So it's really important that you don't just dismiss um, your, your knowledge in this area just because it's literature. And you must show that you understand how context shapes meaning. So when we say context, we mean the environment, culture, and discoveries that were occurring when the writers were writing. Um, you know, think about how you are shaped by your environment, your parents, your friends, your school, um, and the time period in which you you are growing up in. And it's really crucial that you're specific. So what that means is you don't want to make blanketed statements because it doesn't show that you've understood how um, a writer's perspective has been influenced by their environment. OK, so now here's the key. Many students fall foul by not personally engaging with their texts. And the reason for this is because they feel or again, I don't want to say generalized statements, but for many students, it's because they feel afraid that they're going to make a mistake. What they say is not valid. And so they try to just learn, um, you know, set structures. But really, this is denying yourself the opportunity to score a high grade. So how can you therefore show that you're personally engaging with a text? Well, you do this in your introduction. You want to do this immediately. And you start your essay with your thesis statement. A thesis statement is, a main, um, is your main argument. It's a bit like a hypothesis in science. It's your main argument and you use evidence from the text as well as your own research to prove your point. Just as a hypothesis in science, when you're carrying out an experiment, you'll do so to prove, um, prove something, right? So here's an example from one of Up Level Academy's Year 11 students. In Priestley's Drawing Room Drama and Inspector Calls, he presents Mr. Burling as the embodiment of capitalist ideals through him constantly prioritizing profits over his workers. Arguably, Priestley does this to criticize the injustices of society in order to showcase to his predominantly aristocratic audience the importance of social responsibility and the need to change. So you can see that their thesis statement, what is their main argument? Their main argument is that Mr. Burling embodies capitalist ideals in order to bring about change in the audience. Somebody else could argue something different, right? And then we need in our main body to prove our thesis statement. So once you have your thesis statement, you then need to have a carefully crafted main body that proves your thesis statement. So Mr. Burning is presented as a money hungry capitalist at the start of the play through his speech, celebrating Sheila's engagement to Gerald, where he states that he looks forward to a time when Crofts and Burnings can work together for lower costs and higher prices. Not only can the audience infer that Mr. Burling's joy at Sheila and Gerald's engagement is purely due to the political and economical benefits that come um, from Sheila marrying into a socially superior family, but also that he prioritizes financial convention connections over human ones. His selfish nature is further reinforced by his wish to see lower costs and higher prices. Chewing's aims to maximize his profit at the expense of his workers, such as Eva Smith. By the end stress on the antithetical phrase, lower costs and higher prices, it highlights to the audience the lack of justice. It seems imbalanced. 
particularly to a modern audience. However, by the use of the comparatives, it could signify Priestley's expectation and belief that people's mindsets and therefore society can get better and move towards a more compassionate socialist way. So what do you notice in this main body here? So you might see that they've clearly got a strong topic sentence that links back to their thesis, right? And then they also make sure that they have relevant quotes and then they break that quote down. And they do that by making, by inferring, and then they use their knowledge of language and structure to really pull apart the quote. And then they round off again by linking back to the question and again, reinforcing their thesis statement. So it's really important that you take these steps um, so that you can fully dissect your quotes. Then consider other viewpoints. However, some audience members may feel sympathy for Mr. Burning as he does not seem to fit in entirely with the aristocratic world of his wife, which is repeatedly revealed. In the first act, Mrs. Burning scolds Mr. Burning for complimenting the cook in front of Gerald. He also seems akin to Eva Smith as he seems to identify with her by his admiration of her hard work and gumption. Perhaps the best way in which Priestley shows that Mr. Burning does not quite fit into the upper class system is by him being shocked by his wife's coldness towards Eva Smith. In doing this, Priestley could be highlighting how capitalism corrupts people by warping their sense of morality and compassion. So again, can you see how this is really relevant? And this again is on topic and it shows a different idea. And I actually, I'm just gonna add here as well, his wife's coldness was Eva Smith at the end of the play. I think it's really important that you always clarify when events occur or when moments happen to show that you understand the general structure of the play. Um, so again here, have they justified and supported the argument? Well, well yes, they have. So in, you might disagree with this and that's absolutely fine, but they're showcasing another perspective and point of view, which is valued, which is valid, right? But the point is you can't undermine yourself so if you're going to, to do this, you then need to bring it back in alignment with your thesis statement. Does that make sense? Because remember, they're saying that he is uh, mostly unsympathetic, right? That's the, the argument that they're making. So once you've done that, you would then link to the social historical context being specific. Yet, because Mr. Burling decides to not take responsibility for Eva Smith's death, and instead, at the end of the play, when he believes that the inspector is not real, jovially declares, but the whole thing is different now. It would tarnish any sympathy towards him, as it highlights his true, arrogant, selfish nature. Indeed, Mr. Burling's emotional state here seems crass, particularly when juxtaposed with Eric, his son's anguish. Dramatically, Priestley seems to punish Mr. and Mrs. Burling by having the event seemingly about to repeat themselves with the call of an inspector about to come, hinting that they will face interrogation again. This seems to evoke Priestley's fascination with time, particularly Dunn's theory that you could see the past and future in order to avoid consequences. But by Mr. Burling's noticeable return to his state at the start of the play, the audience get a strong sense that he has not learned his lesson. It seems that it is up to the audience to learn social responsibility and avoid repeating the same mistakes. So can you see that they have undermined that um, perspective or, of Mr. Burning being sympathetic? And then they've linked it to specific details of the social historical context. In this case, um, Dunn's theory, which is something that Priestley was fascinated by. And by doing so, it adds weight to their argument. OK, so it's really powerful that you think of all of these parts, just proving your point, proving your argument and in doing so and changing your mindset about it will make it easier rather than just seeing it as something that you just an extra add on. It's there to support your argument and bring it to life in more depth. And then conclusion. So your conclusions, you must summarize all of your main points, make a reflective statement and comment on the overall aims of the writer, the playwright, the poet. You do not just repeat your points. So this is an example. To conclude, this essay has outlined how Priestley uses Mr. Burling to expose the myopic and arrogant mindset of capitalism as demonstrated by Mr. Burling placing money above his workers and even more surprisingly above his family connections. In doing so, 
Priestley successfully shows how capitalism warps the morality of individuals, as it is clear through Mr. Burling's description of Eva Smith that he has relatability with her. Indeed, he seems more akin to her than Mrs. Burling, as highlighted by their interactions. Mrs. Burling is Mr. Burling's social superior, and so corrects him in front of Gerald, thus symbolizing the oppressive nature of the class system due to capitalism. Overall then, through Mr. Burling, Priestley does not just call on the audience to question the morality of the class system and the capitalist ideals that fuel it, but he raises questions about the validity of capitalism and the class system as a whole. As Mr. Burling's character shows how these ideals and systems stunts his growth as a father and businessman, as he seems to lose his children at the end of the play, and let's add a why there, as they are completely alienated from one another, he loses one of his best workers, Eva Smith, and he does not have a close loving relationship with his wife. So can you see how the student has reflected on what's happened? Um, they've also um, you know, summarized the main points and then they've made a comment on what the overall aims of the writer could be. And it's not just repeating, but it's making a point, it's bringing it all together and it's a strong final impression, okay? And that's the point of conclusions. <laughs> Um, and I think that's really important to, to understand, okay? And so to memorize this then, the three top tips to writing a top mark essay are the three Ps. One, personal engagement. This means a thesis statement, which engages with the question and illustrates your personal engagement. Two, prove your thesis. You need to have a main body. It proves your thesis statement by using quotes and exploring different viewpoints, not to undermine your argument, but to strengthen it. And then three, place it in context linked to specific social historical context to show that you understand how um, a writer's point of view and perspective and ideas are influenced by the world in which they um, lived in. I hope this is helpful. In the comments, um, let me know what you liked about this. Um, if you've got any questions, do reach out. Also, um, remember to like and subscribe to the channel where we'll be releasing more videos um, to help with your English studies. Bye for now.